So welcome, uh, everyone. Um, I'll be talking about um, conferential computing on RISC-V. So um, I, um, unfortunately, Atish couldn't make it here. He's uh, um, uh, you know, one of our teammates who's working with us uh, on, on this topic. Um, this topic obviously has a lot of collaborators in, from the RISC-V um, task groups. I have a long list of people in the back, so you probably recognize some of those names. Uh, so my name is Ravi Sahita. Um, I work at Reverse Sync. Um, I, it's a, it's a uh, smaller uh, startup working on uh, RISC V uh, to bring it into the sort of the high performance data center space. Um, and this is one of the security areas. I also uh, am the vice chair of the RISC V um, security horizontal committee. If you're familiar with how the committees are sort of formed or, or you know created in, in RISC V, this bunch of horizontal committees working on different areas and there's a bunch of task groups that are spun off to work on different problems and write the actual specs that the community ratifies. So I'll give you sort of a, a, a big picture of like where things are going in RISC-V from a general security perspective and but we'll dive more deeply into the conventional computing aspects of it and hopefully you know give you a good picture of that as well. The other key goal here is to sort of um, introduce this topic, what's going on in the RISC-V space um, and also, you know, encourage collaboration, you know, since a lot of the RISC-V work is by definition open source um, and sort of open domain, right? Um, so those are the three areas we'll cover and then hopefully we'll leave some time over for questions. Um, so folks uh, are probably familiar with it, but I think uh, it makes sense to kind of start start here, like, you know, describe what RISC-V is and how, how the, you know, different standards are being created. Um, so as folks probably know, it's an open royalty-free instruction set architecture. Um, there's, it's a very simple spec. If, you, if people have looked at it, there's a stable base spec that covers the privilege ISA, and there's a separate unpriv spec that covers the user mode ISA. And there's a bunch of extensions people have been working on over the years, um, some that have been ratified, some that are in the progress, in, in progress that are of being ratified. Um, and as the ratification process goes in RISC-V, it's all managed through this RISC-V International, right, which is a non-profit non home where the stakeholder community sort of comes together, you know, in the form of like the horizontal committees that I mentioned or the special interest groups which look at specific areas and it's like, okay, like for example, confidential computing, it started, started off in the trusted computing special interest group and then people figured out like, oh, we need these ISA parts, let's go form a task group to work on it. And we need non, these non-ISA software or hardware parts, let's go form a task group and go work on it. So that's kind of how, how things are organized. Um, this is a busy chart, but I wanted to, I, I won't dive into pr pretty much any of these topics, but wanted to give you like a big picture of like how the risc horizontal committee is thinking about different security topics, right? The big opportunity obviously we have with risc is because of the clean slate design model and the open ISA model. It gives us a really nice place to, to bring in some of the learnings from various architectures in the past. Like obviously, this is not the first run around at, at a lot of these topics, but RISC-V gives us a, a good place where we can sort of cleanly approach some of these topics and put the best foot forward in terms of an open ISA. Um, like I said, the, the Security HC is looking at various different uh, aspects of it, and they're sort of split between what I call foundational security, you know, that covers also the cryptographic ISA, aspects and there's a bunch of experts there like Marku from uh, PQ Shield and uh, who's al also teaching uh, and Richard Newell and others who lead those those task groups right so if people are interested they should look at that on the software hardening um, side there's a lot of work going on in trusted computing I'll cover some of the confidential computing aspects today uh, but also control flow integrity um, a lot of learnings that have been applied there uh, memory safety has recently become an interesting uh, area of um, you know uh, where a lot of people are coming together and trying to figure out what needs to be done there. Um, and there's a bunch of like other non, -I what, what RISC-V calls non-ISA, but I also fall in the security space, like hey, what should we do for platform hardening? Well, we obviously need things like the IOMMU to be defined and that was recently ratified, right? So those things are also sort of happening. There's a special interest group uh, that's looking at side channel leakage and are trying to understand, okay, from an ISA perspective, what's needed there. Obviously, RISC-V talks a lot about ISA and not as much about microarchitecture. So that's a little bit harder topic to, to discuss there. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, there is a lot of work going on in that, that space as well. Uh, and then I mentioned other things which are sort of not discussed as much in RISC-V International because it doesn't concern the ISA like the hardware root of trust. 
but we do have a security model spec that's been recently written and, and shared with the community where a lot of those ideas and best practices are trying to come together so that we have one place where practitioners can go and look at like, give me one place where I can understand what are the different ISA isolation models in RISC-5, like, and how would I use it in, a, in the context of a particular use case, whether I'm trying to build a secure service engine on my platform or I'm trying to do something more, more complete like confidential computing for a, for a data center like application, right? What building blocks do I need? How do I use them? How do they come together? Right. So that's all going into this into this uh, security model spec, and and that will cover some of the platform lifecycle and other other things that are beyond the beyond the the ISA uh, as such. Um, so as as the, the asterisk or the star shows, I'll I'll dive a little bit to give you a, sort of a deeper dive into the confidential computing aspects, but there are other other topics there for people who are interested in other areas that um, that you can definitely dive into. So a uh, quick introduction to, uh, to confidential computing. Uh, I saw Mike uh, somewhere in the, in the audience. He's, he's at the back. So he's the director of the, the Confidential Computing Consortium. So if you guys have other questions, he's, he's here as well um, to ask. But let me um, ask for a quick poll. Like, uh, How many people are familiar with the term confidential computing? OK, that's about more than, a little bit more than half, which is very encouraging. So I don't have to go into a lot of the background stuff, I can just start off like deep dive into some of the RISC-V specific stuff. So, but just a quick, uh, quick, um, you know, uh, introduction, right? So, confidential computing really focuses on data in use protection, right? It, it, uh, it uh, really observes that a lot of focus up till now has been on protecting how data is, you know, stored in a protected way through, you know, using cryptographic mechanisms. We've been using HTTPS, SSL for a while now, and it's sort of very pervasive. But the data and use parts are really ignored, and and those end up creating a lot of problems. Obviously, in terms of you know whether it's data breaches, insider attacks, general issues with some of like even the build system stuff we were talking about in the morning, like knowing exactly what is running on a platform in terms in terms of its TCB, and being able to articulate that so that you can make a decision about when you want to give data to that system is really the type of problem that confidential computing is trying to solve, right? Um, and that's. So there are critical aspects um, for confidential computing to come together, right? The, the official definition from the CCC is, is performing computation in a hardware-based attested trusted execution environment. So that's a lot of different aspects that need to come together to form the notion of trusted in execution environment that has hardware-based protections, that is also attested through some right cryptographic mechanisms, right? So we'll dive a little bit deeper into that and see, okay, how do we break it down from a RISC-V perspective into what ISA capabilities do we think that, that, that makes sense as a community? And then what other non-ISA capabilities do we need, both in terms of software and other platform elements, right? Um, it also makes sense to kind of look at an example use case. And we were recently, in summer, there was a confidential computing consortium conference where there's a lot of discussion about confidential AI. So I, I picked that up as one of the, the use case because it's sort of, uh, really brings together this notion of why is protecting data in use really critical, right? And confidential AI obviously is, is there's a lot of conversation, discussions about it right now, and it's a good case in point to consider, right? So um, <clears throat> for, for that particular use case, right, the, the idea behind protecting data in use becomes very critical. Like for any of these AI use cases, knowing where, how you're, the data that you're using for training and how you're generating model weights from that is super critical to protecting not just the model that's being generated, but also the data and how it gets used to, to do the training, right? So providing confidentiality for model weights, for most, most of the times the training data is proprietary, um, and also pro protecting the privacy of who's using the model and how they're using it. How, how do you make sure the, the queries you're making to the model are private themselves, right? So a lot of the privacy preserving machine learning capabilities can actually leverage confidential computing as a underpinning infrastructure, right? Um, as, I, as I said, putting like data use controls is useful from a variety of different aspects, not just providing insider threat controls of like, okay, who's actually, actually using the data? What information did they generate from the data? How is the derived information being used? Um, and also pr protecting against general, you know, remote exploits causing sensitive data breaches, things like that, right? So just from a data privacy perspective, it's a, it's a good way to quantify exactly who did you give your data to and you know what were your sort of you know 
properties and principles you are placing around the use of that data, right? So when you break it down further, that trusted execution environment, <coughs> what, what does trust in that execution environment means? It actually means that when you're giving data to that trusted execution environment, you want the ability at a minimalistic way, you need some data confidentiality and integrity, right? Of, okay, who's, who's able to modify the data? Who's able to access the data? You also need code integrity for the transforms that you're doing on the data to know that you actually perform the computations that you expected to perform. And also attestation to know both a priori before you give the data over to a certain entity or computing element, and also after that it was actually transformed the way you expected it to be transformed, right? So that's the sort of the process for, for attestation. Um, it also makes sense to quickly look at this threat model. Again, the, we could have like a two hour long presentation or more just on the threat model itself, because it's such a, such a vast topic, but uh, it's, it's a good uh, reference point to quickly look at some of these uh, attacks. Right? So when looking at a threat model for confidential computer, or anyone for that matter, it makes sense to look at it from the assets perspective. Obviously for a confidential computing case, the assets are whatever your data is, right? Whatever, whatever you define as a sensitive data as a data owner. Right? And that relies on a TCP or a trusted computing base, which would be formed with hardware or software. Right? Again, that you define saying, hey, my TCB is this hardware engine, this firmware capability on it, this other OS that I'm using, and this particular application or container that I want to run, right? and, and nothing else. Right? You really want to be able to quantify that. Um, and so in terms of attacks, you really have to look at a um, set of attacks or a family of attacks when you're thinking about that scenario, all the way going from simple software attacks, which may be you know, unprivileged adversary or privileged adversary, all the way down to software supply chain attacks or hardware supply chain attacks. Right? And we saw a good evidence of the, the talk today morning in, in Rene's and uh, uh, in, in, the, in the university talk on, on some of these supply chain attacks, but there are also other physical attacks and hardware supply chain attacks that we need to be aware of. Um, the other two cases that I mentioned here are cryptographic attacks and protocol attacks. Those are, it's not sufficient to basically say, you know, okay, I have, I have, you know, ensured correct supply chain in both in software and hardware. I also want to make sure I'm using the right protocols. So the protocol, the key strengths you're using are not weak so that, you know, you don't run into any, 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 any of those attacks where somebody can, you know, trivially do an adversary in the middle and, and cause a attack. Um, so those are all, all important ones to kind of look at as we, as we look at these, uh, these scenarios. And the one learning as we put this, just by the, the security model together, was from the community that there's no one size fits all here. We really have to look at these, these types of attacks and depending on the capability or solution you're putting together, you really have to make an advised, get, you know, sort of educated uh, decision on what attacks you are, are within your scope vis-a-vis -vis your adversary model and which ones are you, are you going to tackle and how, right? Because that's really the, the cost benefit trade-off you, you have to make. Um, in the case of confidential computing itself, some cases might be considered as out of scope. Again, it depends on, on your, um, your, the, the capability or the solution you're putting together. But some examples might be very advanced physical attacks where somebody is taking a chip and delayering it and, and spending months on, on trying to attack it. Again, that may be in, your, in the scope of your, uh, your adversary model and then you should address it. Um, advanced supply chain attacks, right, beyond, beyond, beyond simple attacks where you have insider threats from your designers, things like that. And denial of service, right? Denial of service from a confidential computing perspective is, is out of scope, right? Because there the focus is really on protecting the data and making sure that data is never leaked or, or loses confidentiality. Whereas in some other environments like embedded platforms, denial of service may truly be in scope, right? And, but that's out of scope from a confidential computing perspective. Um, Okay, so, so shifting gears a little bit, starting to dive into, um, for RISC-V, what does it mean, right? What are the, how do we achieve these different aspects that we want of data confidentiality, integrity, which can be achieved through access control mechanisms, through cryptographic mechanisms, or a combination of those, right? Um, so we split them into sort of like, what belongs in ISA extensions? How do we want to change the RISC-V ISA from where it is right now, what's, what's stable and ratified to what extensions to be added in the future? What are the non-ISA extensions do we think, do we, need, do we need in this platform, or at least we want to make recommendations on, right, that people may want to think about. And risc sort of has this terminology for non-ISA, which is anything that has not the ISA, right? Um, and that really falls into hardware and software. Um, so whatever work we do in terms of specifications we build in terms of software ABIs are also sort of categorized as non-ISA. 
And the, in the case of confidential computing, these are really interfaces that we want to build following a lot of the good work that has been done in the community already for Linux, for other architectures like, uh, uh, like x86 for uh, TDX, for example, or for ARM CCA and really following a lot of those design patterns to make sure we can align well with some of those interfaces, but bridge the gap to what we need for, for risk right? Um, so we'll touch upon uh, that sort of um, third pillar as well. So um, let me just keep a track of time. Um, so we'll do like a, I'll go fast through some of the basic intro stuff because I assume people are sort of familiar with it, but I think it, it, it makes sense to touch upon some of those before we dive into why we are proposing some of the ISA extensions, right? So um, here's a quick background into the, the Previsa for, um, for RISC-5 and I'll talk about the hypervisor extension as well, right? So RISC-5 has basically, like many other architectures, has different privilege modes of operation. There's a user mode for user mode applications, a kernel or supervisor mode which Linux and other, other environments see. And there's a firmware or platform mode like uh, called machine mode, right? Where, where usually platform firmware will run. And then there are very simple sort of, um, you know, call mechanisms and trap mechanisms, return mechanisms defined to be able to traverse from, you know, or transition from like a U mode into the kernel mode or kernel mode into machine mode to invoke platform services and the reverse, right? So it's a very, very straightforward, uh, um, you know, sort of mechanism. The same mechanism is also extended through an extension in the ISA that's now been ratified called hypervisor extension, right? Which basically extends the supervisor mode so that you can essentially support the notion of running, you know, unmodified guest operating systems, right? And when that happens, essentially that's, that's managed in the, in the architecture through this virtualization mode. When virtualization mode is enabled, you essentially have a VS and a VU mode, right? Where your, your guest operating system and applications can run, right? The idea here is that the hardware handles this notion of when your virtualization bit is active, that your unmodified operating system, when it's act interacting with S mode CSRs, it essentially has a bank of virtual CSRs that the hardware will re redirect those access to, right? To allow the, the operating system to essentially run as uh, unmodified, right? So this, this baseline contract of the ISA has been ratified. It's part of the ratified uh, uh, ISA for S5. And we are sort of building on top of that for our mechanisms that we use in confidential computing, right? So, Hence, what we are what we are calling our uh, our, our ISA for um, for confidential computing is called well, COPE, right? Um, it al also is a synonym with sort of a, a protected area, right? But it stands for confidential VM extension, right? So we are leveraging the the ISA and, and we're leveraging the hypervisor extension to essentially create this notion of a new um, entity called a TEVM or a trusted virtual machine, right? Um, now, what we what we observe was Having the Privisa and the Hypervisor extension is not sufficient for us to, you know, provide the entire notion of a, a TEVM because we also wanted to reduce the TCB and really be able to quantify and allow people to really restrict the TCB um, that they're running on that on the platform. Right, and this is showing sort of a, a reference architecture picture for Co, where we introduced the notion of a TE security manager or a TSM that essentially can leverage the full power of the Priv ISA, right? So, you know, you can run it in 32-bit mode or 64-bit mode, um, RV64. Um, but it gives us the ability to sort of use that same, same Priv ISA without introducing new semantics and things like that, but in a, in a trusted manner, right? And that requires some, ad some additional extensions to be able to isolate it and provide certain guarantees that we need in the, in the architecture to build some of those, those primitives that we wanted of data confidentiality and access control, right? Um, so that's sort of uh, one aspect, right? So we need, need a capability so that we can host things like a TE security manager. The other thing was we did not want to restrict this to like one TE security manager, because again, thinking about it from different use cases, people may want the ability to run their own attested TE security managers for different use cases, right? So even though I'm, I'm in this sort of canonical reference architecture showing two sort of domains running here, where you have like a hosting domain and a confidential domain, the ISA that we are proposing in, the, in, in what is called a supervisor domains architecture allows that ISA to extend to other parallel sort of supervisor domains as well, right? Um, the other important aspect to note here is that uh, once we have that capability of running these isolated domains, um, we can again leverage a lot of the parts of the, the Privisa in, the, in terms of the Hypervisa extension to allow these TE security managers to further isolate the guests or TVM context that run on top of it, right? So that puts, that gives us a clear delineation of the security properties 
where the, the root domain manager that you see at the bottom running in M mode has the properties to isolate between what we call supervisor domains, right? And you may have many or more than two. And then each supervisor domain context uses the provisor to provide isolation for contexts that are assigned to that supervisor domain, right? And it's really a matter of TCB and choice and attestation policy to decide what workload gets placed in what supervisor domain, right? And you can make a decision about that based on the attestation that you pass to a relying party. Um, there are other platform elements that uh, that come into play here as well, right? How do we protect the data that leaves leaves the SOC package, for example? Um, how do we restrict other ISA mechanisms that are active and defined on the platform, like performance monitoring, QoS, RAS, things like that, um, and and other other aspects like which are important from a device perspective, like debug, right, tracing, um, those kind of aspects. So I'll touch upon those as well. Um, lastly, in this picture, as you see, I'm sort of showing these IOMMUs at the bottom, and I'm not showing any devices, but that's something we've been thinking about it from the beginning, like how do we make sure when we host these TE workloads, even though we are leveraging the, the previsor and the hypervisor extension with some, with some additional ISO mechanisms, we want to make sure this works well for wherever the workload runs, right? Whether it's running on a CPU complex or a GPU complex or using functions from an accelerator, the workloads that span those functions should be encompassed as part of the, the TVM. Right? So I'll touch upon some of that that we are sort of calling a co-IO extension, um, which, is, which is an important aspect uh, going forward, especially for applications like uh, machine learning. So here's a sort of a 50,000 foot view of the, the Previsa extension called Supervisor Domains. And we'll, I'll break it down into some of the separate uh, um, sort of modular sub extensions that, that form part of this. Uh, as you know, in, in RISC V, a lot of the extensions are built as, uh, as smaller extensions, and that allows for modularity and choice in terms of when people are implementing things that they can choose to, to implement the, the extensions that they, they want to implement. So it's supervised domains, as I mentioned, we want to sort of maintain the, the Previsa contract that we have today, but sort of provide this. Uh, this horizontal isolation between these contexts, right? So that um, you know, platform providers or, or service providers that are that are building systems can essentially decide how they how they carve up the platform and, and create the the TCB sort of pools that they want to create, right? And you, you should be able to attest to all of these verticals that, that are shown here, right? Um, so the first sort of primitive uh, we needed um, in in this picture was to provide a way to do scalable physical memory isolation. So for folks who are familiar with RISC-V, know that we've had things like PMPs or physical memory uh, protection registers for a while. There's also IO PMP capability, but those are very limited and targeted towards em embedded platforms where you have very static policies of how the memory is carved up. Um, with, uh, with the supervised domain model, we wanted a much more scalable model. So, um, so I'll, I'll jump to that one and I'll come back, come back by one slide. So the, the first sort of extension we started off was to look at this memory tracking table, right? And so, um, so this file has this like weird nomenclature for uh, naming extensions. So when you see something like a SMMTT, it stands for a, a supervisor mode extension that, that's applied to machine mode, which is the M in the middle, and then the MTT is the actual feature. So you'll see like this, 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 no, this tom nomenclature sort of repeated for, for other ISA extensions as well. Um, so SMMTT is essentially a, a, a memory tracking table extension that allows the, the, the controlling software, in this case the root domain security manager, to essentially assign physical memory access permissions on a page based level to different supervisor domains, right? So assume you, 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 boot it, you securely boot it into a platform, you use a hardware root of trust to measure your RDSM, which is sort of the controlling entity, and then the RDSM can start Im imposing memory tracking table policies to basically say, hey, here's how I'm, I'm carving out my access control permissions across a hosting domain, a confidential domain, and so on and so forth, right? And the ABI sort of works on top of that to define models of how do you move memory scalably between supervisor domains, right? So assuming all memory starts off in a hosting domain first, and then is converted to or passed on to a particular supervising domain, and that's all sort of carved, you know, provided by the, the ABI. And then the ABI is supported through ISO mechanisms to essentially allow for the right memory fencing operations and all those things to happen so that the right permissions are enforced even, even when the, the system is running, right? 
So this picture is sort of showing the logical view of MTT, right? Both from the CPU side access perspective and the IO side access perspective. Like I said, this is from, from the RISC-V perspective, we were sort of trying to look at this from, from both the CPU and the GPU side together, right? So that we, we are not sort of creating some like weird semantics or different semantics between the two, right? So, so on the CPU side, as you can see, your, your access comes in through a, through an address, maybe a virtual address or maybe a physical address, depending on what modes are activated on that particular CPU, right? But let's take the, the most complex case of a fully, a guest virtual address comes in, right? From a guest context. Right. That's typically translated through a first stage page, page table address um, translation that's owned by the guest operating system. It's translated by a G state page table, which is how a hypervisor or the TSM in the context of Co partitions guest physical addresses, right? Or, or, or remaps guest physical address to the real system physical address. And the system physical address is the one that's, that's subject to the memory tracking table lookup, right? So the memory tracking table essentially allows to, to the RDSM to make a decision whether a particular physical memory resource is accessible to that supervised domain or not, right? And that basic construct is, is very powerful in terms of access controlling regular DRAM memory, memory mapped IO regions, or other, other uh, aspects like, you know, interrupt files that live in memory and things like that, right? So we'll see how it's used in various other, other places. And the same kind of uh, mechanism sort of happens from the from a device function side, right? From a device side, you will you will typically start off with again. Let's take a complex case of starting off with a I/O virtual address, right? Where the device is accessing some some virtual address uh, from the I/O perspective, and the the I/O memory extension for for RISC five for folks who may not have seen it was very recently ratified, right? And it sort of follows the same model, right? Where you take a particular device request depending on the fabric the request is coming in from. Let's say for PCI example, it might be a, a requester ID or a bus device function, and that will be mapped through a device context table to identify the, the, uh, the second state paging structure. But if a, if, a, if a process ID is specified, you can also walk through a first level paging structure, right, to maintain the same model of accessing memory that is assigned to a process, right, to translate that address. And the same way, once you resolve it to a system physical address, the IOMMU can invoke a separate IO entity checker to essentially resolve their address to a physical permission, right, for that resource. So no matter whether the access is coming from a RISC five heart or from a processing element that's on a, on an accelerator, you get very consistent permissions that you can you can apply for that supervised domain, right? Um, the other thing I sort of sort of showed here is obviously. This works in conjunction with the PMP and IOPMP. So those legacy mechanisms if implemented still are active and, and uh, applicable, right? The other thing, other thing to call out in this slide as the, the side arrows show, right? Depending on what modes are turned on on a particular heart, you might have disabled first level paging or you might have disabled second level paging, the MTT permissions still hold. So there are different modes defined in the MTT that tell you what mode you're running in and what physical address size uh, addressability you're supporting. Right, that tells you, you know, what, how the RDSM sets up those table structures. Um, so let me jump back one slide that I skipped. So, so this supervisor domain um, extension, the 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 best analogy to think of this is in in RISC five today currently for uh, for processes we have an address space identifier, right? For VMs or with the hypervisor extension, we have the notion of a VM ID or a virtual machine identifier that lets you tag different structures that you might be using in the, in the implementations, like TLBs or, or uh, um, uh, you know, any, any address translation structures to optimize your, uh, your access control permission enforcement. The supervisor domain essentially adds an analog supervisor domain identifier, right? So that depending on the, the memory translation or the memory tracking table permissions you're applying, you can also optimize how you're caching those, those permissions in the implementation, right? And to support that, there are new M mode uh, supervised domain fence instructions described here or, or uh, a spec in the specification, which basically are shown here as the mfence.spa or the, uh, the mnval.spa. Those are variants to support uh, different uh, memory ordering models that, uh, that RISC-V has. And I'll come back to the, the, the supervised domain config register in a second, but the memory tracking uh, register is sort of CSR shown in the top which contains both the supervisor domain identifier, the mode you're operating in, and a root table pointer to the memory tracking table structure. So 
depending on the what supervised domain is activated by the RDSM on a particular heart, that memory tracking table can be made active in terms of its persona. So you could literally have a, a many core system with one core running in one supervised domain when another core is running in a hosting domain or, or an alternate supervised domain. Um, so this view sort of shows a quick uh, view of the, the SMMTT extension or the memory tracking table. The top view, I'm just showing the RV64 case here. There is an analog for the RV32 case that you can look at in the spec. But for the RV64 case, the physical address that's resolved after the, the page walk is essentially fed through this uh, memory tracking table, right? Now, the memory tracking table that's, that's defined here is very much biased towards large page sizes so that we make sure like these permissions for these physical addresses are, co are as compact as possible, right? They can also be supported in implementation by the right sort of caching structures so that you reduce the amount of memory lookups you have to do for this memory tracking table structures, right? But net-net, you, you start with a PA or a system physical address and for different page sizes, four kilobytes, you know, two megabytes or one gig, um, you essentially resolve that to a, a, a set of read-write permissions or read-write execute permissions for those, those pages. So you can essentially resolve any physical address to a, a you know, full permission set um, and, then, and then make decisions on that. Within, within, the, within the core. Um, so I, I mentioned the IMMU. I, I thought it makes sense to sort of put this in the slide just for, for completeness. So this uh, IMMU spec was recently ratified uh, along with the advanced interpreter architecture spec. Uh, both, are, both are now now ratified and people have been working on, you know, doing the, the Linux drivers and the, the infrastructure for it. But essentially the, the IMMU, uh, I, walk, I showed you like the, the page walk earlier. Um, is essentially the analog of the MMU on the IO side, right? It gives you a, a, a structured approach to essentially start from uh, IO virtual address and walk through a set of device context and page table structures to essentially resolve to a, to a system physical address that's subject to the uh, MTT translation. So I just put this links here for people who are interested in looking at um, the, some of those specs. Um, so this slide sort of shows, you know, once you sort of know how an IOMME works and how it does a, the, a sideband look aside to translate IOVA to a system physical address, this shows sort of one, one example of how an IOMTT side checker can be integrated into that pipeline, right? So when an inbound request comes in, it's resolved through a new entity here called a, a supervised domain classifier that will basically take a request type, like example of PCIe being a RID, and translate that read to a to a supervised domain, right? Which will essentially give you the context for that supervised domain, and then you follow the standard MTT check to basically say, okay, once my IMMU completes the task of translating that IOVA to the system physical address, I can use the the MTT checker to essentially make a decision whether that access is permitted for that domain or not, right? So this really helps in the scenario where the RDSM decides to give away a particular IOMMU or assign an IOMMU to a supervised domain. Right, so that that supervised domain can man, man, manage that IOMME and all the devices downstream, right? Um, and that that sort of simplifies that that whole model that the RDSM doesn't have to emulate or arbitrate access to those those IOMME structures, right? Um, but it can still maintain the isolation between different supervised domains. Um, I put in a couple of slides for um, a quick intro to the advanced intro to architecture. Uh, simply stated, like the advanced intro to architecture in RISC five gives you the ability to route interrupts for, from an APLIC uh, or, uh, or a PCI device that's using me message signal interrupts into a heart, right? And the way it does that is by using an MSIC or an incoming MS MSI controller, right? Which essentially is a, is a set of mode specific interrupt files, right? So if you have no hypervisor extension, then you would have an M mode interrupt file and an S mode interrupt file and, and so on. If you have a, a hypervisor uh, extension implemented, then the AI spec sort of had, adds this spec for guest interrupt files, right? So you can have a hard implementation with a, with a limited number of guest interrupt files behind it. Um, obviously, when, when you're using hypervisor, the IMME also needs to learn new tricks in terms of mapping the, the, the MSIs to go to the right guest, guest interrupt files, right? So there's an MSI remapping that happens that the IM, RVI uh, IMME supports, right? Additionally, since that guest interrupt files are a limited resource, for over provisioning guest interrupt files on CPUs or on hearts, you need the ability to be able to side back to offline certain interrupt files, right? So the, the RISC-V IMMU supports the notion of memory resident interrupt files, uh, or rather AI supports the notion of memory resident interrupt files, 
where you can essentially use atomic operations to write, to take a guest interrupt file that's associated with the heart and move it offline into memory, right? The reason I want to go over this background is because you can see now, once you have a construct like the memory tracking table, which can isolate memory scalably between supervised domains, you can also now scalably isolate whether it's guest interrupt files that are memory mapped accessed or memory resident interrupt files, right? To ensure that uh, that interrupt uh, 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 isolation is also performed correctly for supervised domains, right? So that's where, where this, uh, SMS uh, DIA, which stands for sup Supervisor Machine Mode Supervisor Domain Interrupt Assignment, comes in, right? So that, that's where this extension comes in, um, which essentially has the, the security objective for the RDSM to mention, meant to, to enforce the integrity of interrupt assignment to supervisor domains, right? So when you have a confidential domain, one of the known attack vectors is to, is to confuse a confidential domain in terms of interrupt delivery. In fact, some of the recent uh, um, attack papers were, were pointing out like, hey, if you can like drop a particular interrupt or cause the rerouting of a particular interrupt or change the priority ordering, you can cause runtime issues in the, in the confidential domain. So SMSCI essentially allows the RDSM to perform, to do basically two things with a set of very simple CSR additions, right? It essentially allows the RDSM to associate <laughs> different supervised domain interrupt files with, uh, with the corresponding physical resource. And it gives the machine mode or the RDSM the ability to, um, to capture any pending notifications from supervised domains that are offline, right? Because an interrupt, external interrupt can come in at any time. So simply with these additions of a uh, couple of these CSRs, um, as the, the, the red line shows, a notification, a new notification uh, type is added for the machine mode that essentially tells it that a ex external interrupt is pending for one of the supervised domains, right? So the RDSM can get, go interact, interrogate these CSRs and can stage that for the corresponding supervised domain. If the supervised domain is already active and has been selected with this uh, supervised domain config selector, right, then that interrupt can be sim simply delivered by virtue of the right supervised mode interrupt file being selected, right? And since the supervised domain code already has access to that supervised domain interrupt file, all those interactions that AI defines in terms of accessing those CSRs, selecting the, the interrupt type, enabling it, disabling it, et cetera, those all remain exactly the same, right? So it allows us to flow through that, that interrupt following the same contract that the advanced interrupt architecture has. While, while still giving the RDSM the ability to cleanly isolate the, the interrupt delivery. Um, so a little bit about the, um, I, I realize I'm, I'm running close to the end of time, but I think I have a couple of slides to, to cover. Um, so a little bit on the Cove ABI. So like I said, a lot of the stuff that I covered so far were all the ISA mechanisms that we need to add for memory isolation, for interrupt isolation, uh, for IO isolation, et cetera. But we also need to provide the right software interfaces between somebody implementing a TSM or the TE security manager that runs in, in the, as shown here in the, uh, in the HS mode of execution and the operating system that's doing the resource management, right? So this model is actually very similar to models you might have seen in, in other architecture implementations, like Intel TDX has a similar model where you have a TDX module and interfacing with a Linux host or KVM host. Um, ARM CCA has a very similar model where you have a RMM interfacing with the Linux host, right? Um, so we've, we've sort of modeled this interface the same so that it dovetails nicely into a lot of the infrastructure work that's being done in Linux uh, KVM and all these uh, these uh, uh, these modules anyway, right? And we've split those interfaces into a Cove H, which is the the hypervisor side interface, and a Cove G, which is a guest side interface, right? Um, and and define sort of the interactions that we need behind those interfaces, so that when you're doing, for example, memory assignment, where memory is is, is being moved from a confident a non-confidential domain into a confidential domain, the the right intrinsics are are put in place behind those flows in the TSM so that they can trigger the right ISA interactions. Right. Um, there is an open source project for people who are interested that was uh, implemented by us. Uh, it's a Rust-based TSM implementation called Salus that's, that's linked here. Um, there's also a QMU implementation of the SMMTT, uh, you know, the core ISA portions that's uh, available in, uh, in open source now. That was done by one of the students recently in, uh, in RBI. Um, and there's a new software security working group being formed in RICE. RICE, for people who don't know, is a 
is a sort of a RISPI software ecosystem, uh, you know, consortium that's uh, been put together to uh, help people working on RISPI to sort of work on common things like code infrastructure, uh, build systems, things like that, uh, looking at different distributions. Uh, so there is a there is a security work group being formed there as well to bring together some of these common elements like hey, if I'm writing an RDSM and I want to write write it in, in Rust and make sure it's open source and well vetted, you know, can we do that together as opposed to everybody writing their own, right? Um, <clears throat> I won't really get time to go through a little a lot of this, but I wanted to introduce this co IO stuff, right? Which is sort of new uh, interfaces or ABIs that we need to add. A lot of this work is being done right now in the Linux open source domain, uh, along with other implementations in this generic framework called TEIO, right? Of how we take device functions that might be on an accelerator and bind them to a TVM, right? So there is this whole flow defined here of you, you know, how does a, a host OS expose a device to a TVM, right? How does the, DV, the TVM authenticate the device function, and then how does it go ahead and accept that device function into its trust boundary, right? Um, so th this is a very common flow across many of the implementations that are happening across other architectures as well. Um, so there is a there's a common working group in the in the Linux Cocoa uh, work group, if people are familiar, uh, that's been discussing this thing and how do we use the standards that are coming out of uh, PCIe, uh, like IDE, which stands for um, uh, Integrity and Data Data Protection between the a PCIe uh, endpoint, right? Uh, as well as TDISP. TDISP is another sort of standard for if I have a device function, how do I, in a, in a, in a standard way, assess the state of that device function? Is it like, uh, is it, is its uh, configuration locked down for me to start using it, right? Um, so TDISP sort of sets up a, a set of verbs that you can interrogate a device and, and uh, put it in the right state for being used by a, by a TVM. Um, so that, that, that's, that's, uh, that's a newer spec for, for RISC-5 as well. Uh, it's in its uh, uh, initial stage of uh, 0.2 uh, version. And we are sort of doing building that in conjunction with the with the Linux open source, uh, uh, you know, folks who are looking at the common common verbs for that. Uh, last but not the least, some of the hardware root of trust uh, is an important capability from an attestation perspective. Again, here we are relying on a lot of the standards that people are putting putting together for attestation. Um, attestation has been sort of been worked on in the ITF for a while, as well as in the TCG, uh, the Trusted Computing Group. There's a standard uh, that TCG put out called DICE, right, which stands for Device Identity Composition, uh, which is basically a layered attestation model. This is essentially when you start from a hardware root of trust, how do you ensure that the hardware root of trust itself is trusted, right? Its configuration has to be, you know, uh, explicitly uh, endorsed by by the silicon creator, and then how does it go on and measure other elements of your TCB and capture those measurements in a way where you can cryptographically verify from a relying party, right? So that whole attestation process, we're trying to make sure we use a lot of the existing standards that uh, and common frameworks that are being uh, built there, so that we are not reinventing the the, the wheel there. Um, in terms of the the RISC V itself, you know, there's there's a, a good engine for people to look at called Open Titan, which is basically a, 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 an open source secure silicon built using a RISC V core as the the main control processor. So if if you know, folks want an example of okay, how's risk five being used in in that domain, right? But that is one of the important building blocks from a confidential computing perspectives. A um, couple other things, I guess we talked about other threats on the platform. Uh, we won't get to cover a lot of this, but I wanted to call attention to these. Like when you're building a platform that is being applied for confidential computing, you need to have a very clear story around you know how do you deal with invasive debug, like you know, you know. Think of like tracing frameworks or external debug frameworks. Um, how do you deal with machine monitoring frameworks like QoS, uh, for example? Um, and some of the mitigations or, or design patterns that can be applied there, uh, obviously using cryptographic protections when information is leaving the package, right? So things like using memory encryption on for DRAM or PCI ID is another good example for, for data fabrics like PCIe. Filtering by specific supervised domains, we have, we are providing some frameworks, for example, for uh, external debug and things like that to be able to filter by supervised domain. Um, opting in when some of these capabilities are turned on for a particular supervised domain or a context within a supervised domain, opting in and making that information explicitly aware in the attestation is a good way to also tell a relying party like, hey, this TVM that you're interfacing with has debugging turned on. Do you still want to 
you know, share your data with this TVM. You, you, you probably may, you can make a policy choice to, to uh, decide whether to do that. Uh, and then lastly, restricting access or enforcing access uh, or configuration through the hardware root of trust, for example, so that you know that the configuration of that fabric or the configuration of that subsystem can truly be trusted. Right? So those are some mit you know, sort of methods of mitigation, I guess, uh, that uh, we've been looking at for, for those aspects. But a lot of these are very implementation-oriented, non-ISA aspects. So we leave those as recommendations in the security model um, for people to look at uh, from a from a implementation perspective. Right? Um, so just to summarize, I, I touched upon some of the ISA mechanisms in a little bit more detail, um, uh, but I hopefully give you a good flavor for like where some of these extensions are are going and uh, some of the software interfaces that that are being built as well. Um, you know, and hopefully there's enough information for people to go uh, look at and uh, um, follow through. Uh, the last, I guess, call to action I had was, uh, you know, I, we think this is an important capability for really any platform that is that is going to operate on sensitive data, uh, especially more so in the in the in the space we are in with uh, things like confidential AI. Um, and there's a, like a, like a number of task groups that are actively working on these ISA and uh, both non-ISA aspects. So. I'd welcome folks to you know come and join those TGs as, either as individual members or as uh, members from from organizations that are part of RISC Five, um, and you can also participate if you're not part of RISC Five. You can also participate in some of the open source domains where uh, like Linux and KVM and others where we are discussing these uh, these intrinsics from a um, you know turning on these capabilities or interfacing with other subsystems in in Linux. So. Um, a lot of, lot of work remains to be done and you know, I welcome this community. Uh, especially from a, a security perspective, it really helps to get more, more eyes on it as Rene pointed out earlier. So uh, with that, you know, I, I thank you for your attention. There's, like I said, there's a lot of people involved in the, in the task groups from, from various uh, organizations as, and individuals. So I wanted to give a shout out to, uh, to them as well. Thank you. So the question was, does the secure interrupt stuff apply only for physical devices and not for virtual devices? And then I think the second question was, does it also apply to IPI and things like that? Yeah, so I think the second question was, yeah, it applies to IPIs and things like that also, right? Because those are all routed through the same mechanisms. In terms of physical devices virtual versus virtual devices, so from a, from a general virtualization perspective, right? Even if you look at like nested virtualization, for example, right? From a hardware perspective, there's there's really only two levels, right? There's 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 physical and there's virtual, right? Any virtualization above that is sort of a software contract, right? So, so yes, the secure interrupt stuff applies to physical devices, right? But if, let's say you're assigning a device into a supervised domain through an IMMU, right? The, including the IMMU, right? The, any virtual contacts that are running on top of it are really being managed by the TCB software in that supervised domain, right? So think like, like, let's take the example of a NIC. If you have a, if you have a like a SRIOV NIC, right, that's behind that IMMU domain, and you assign that to a supervised domain, that TSM is free to virtualize that NIC to other workloads above it, right? And that's really the, the, the control point is that supervised domain software or the TSM inside that supervised domain. So it can scale that up for other virtual interfaces. If you look at other new capabilities like scalable IOV, for example, right, which is sort of you know being discussed in OCP and other forums, it's sort of the same kind of model, right? You know, you have a set of work queues assigned to some context, some workload context, right? Um, it's it's still your your mediating software that's breaking up that workload, is really becomes part of your TCB, right? So yeah, once you do your physical assignment your next level multiplexing is owned by that TCB software that's in your path. But you have to do a physical assignment, so on the host you can't have, you know, you obviously can't apply to virtualize devices on the host, you can virtualize the stuff on the host, that's out of question. That's right, so if, you, if you're in a situation where you have to rely on the host software for the virtualization, uh, 
then you have to use some other logical protection mechanisms for the data that's going to that channel, right? It's like, that's kind of like what we would do before we had an ability to pass devices through. You would, you would rely on some emulated device, but then it's like using virtual block storage or virtual networking. You have to make sure your SSL endpoint is running within your confidential domain, right? So that the, the transport is essentially untrusted. Um, so the hardware root of trust, I think, is sort of like orthogonal to the to the ISA mechanisms I talked about here, because your hardware root of trust could be different implementations, right? There are some like critical requirements on the hardware root of trust that you want to have, right? Uh, for example, you want to make sure you have a subsystem in the hardware root of trust that can implement dice, for example, right? Some some engine that can hold keys that are associated with certain identities that you're building, right? And you might have an identity for the silicon creator, you might have an independent identity for identity, like I'm using open tightening terms here, for like a silicon owner, right? Or the entity that programs that, that, that engine, you might have an identity for a platform integrator and a platform owner, right? So you need to be able to have an engine that supports these different roles, right? It's I think it's implement. It's up to the implementations to choose different engines that give you that capability, right? Um, so Open Titan is like one example that I gave. There are others, you know, that that people use, but it sort of comes down to do you have the right perimeters on that, you know, that root of trust, right? Um, that gives you. I think TCG TCG uses the terminology of like, do you have a root of trust for measurement, right? Do you have an entity that can hold measurements as you're evolving the platform and booting up different capabilities on the platform, right? Um, do, you have a, do you have a root of trust for storage, right? So that you can do things like sealing and unsealing secrets to the platform, right? Um, things like that, right? So, yeah. I'm getting a red flag from the back um, to stop for lunch. I guess, no, for the next talk, actually. Uh, so yeah, uh, please uh, ask me other questions if you might have. I'll be here both the days. Thank you.